The theme of today's seminar is the generous nature of God. And our text of scripture, as we earlier read, is Psalm 145, 14 to 16. Psalm 145, 14 to 16. As I began to prepare the message, it was impressed upon my heart by the Holy Spirit to study the entire chapter with a title, A Song of God's Majesty and Love, A Praise of David. And by the time I finished studying Psalm 145, I was so nourished and encouraged that I proceeded to study Psalm 146 also. Its own title is The Happiness of Those Whose Help is in the Lord. Are there such people here this morning? The happiness of those whose help is in the Lord. Do you know what I found out at the end of studying both Psalms 145 and 46? I found out that both Psalms were written to extol and praise the God of Zion. What a tremendous joy sprang up in my heart and my soul as both chapters capture all the nuances of our current series, Living in Zion. If you don't mind, I would like to respectfully ask you to rise to your feet as we read the two Psalms together, one after the other, and charge this atmosphere with the praise of the God of Zion. Psalm 145, 1 to 21. Psalm 145, 1 to 21, I want you to lift up your voices. We are charging the atmosphere with the praise of the God of Zion. You realize when that lady came out today to start leading worship, except you are not profound in Yoruba language, you will not understand what she was saying. She was not making incantation. She was doing an invocation, calling the presence of God to come into being, telling God how much is appreciated, how big he is, and how no one can intimidate him. And so I want you to charge the atmosphere today with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Charge the atmosphere with the praise of the God of Zion. Are you ready? One, two, go. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his words. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord of hosts all will fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, 
to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. And the people said, Amen. Amen. Psalm 146, verse 1 to 10. Psalm 146, 1 to 10. Ready? Read. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his plan perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord, is God. Who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord gives freedom to the prisoners, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind, the Lord raises those who are bowed down, the Lord loves the righteous, the Lord watches over the strangers, he relieves the fatherless and widow. By the way of the wicked, it turns upside down. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? One, two, go. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Praise the God of Zion. 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 Hallelujah. You may be seated in the awesome presence of God. For the few minutes we have left, our theme once again is the generous nature. Of God. Say that with me. The generous nature of God. People of God, whenever we think about God and try to find a word to describe Him, we do not often come up with giving. We are more familiar with God being called loving, forgiving, just, gracious, merciful, and righteous, etc., etc. But I think it is high time we realized that giving is at the heart of all these divine characteristics. Our God is a genuine giver through and through. Everything we know about God reveals is LDG. Say that with me. Everything we know about God does what? Reveals is LDG. Say LDG. Say, Pastor, what is that? LDG is the acronym for Lavish divine generosity. Lavish divine generosity. Examples of God's given surround us all. Our homes and families, our God-given abilities, our life, our world. All these reveal the generous nature of an all-given God. From the very beginning, when God anticipated the need of mankind, he commanded the waters, waters to abound with an abundance of living creatures. 
and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the large expanse of the firmament of heavens. Genesis 1, 20 to 21, as God began to anticipate the need of mankind, in Genesis 1, 20 to 21, then God said, this is the fifth day, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures. And let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures, many of them you don't know. And every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. When I say many of them you don't know, you'll be wondering well, 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 what else is there to be, to be seen and to be known. My wife and I and our children, we were in the Asian Sea. You recall this? Many years ago. That was when we snorkeled. Uh, what, what was it called? We were snow diving into the sea. Mrs. B didn't join us. We were riding uh, on, on, on water scooters. And my son and I went to 150 feet below sea. And we saw fish in their different schools gathering. And they gave us some things to feed them. And we were feeding the fish. And they were receiving and were so happy. Suddenly, I realized, wait a minute. Is my first son and I under the sea? <laughs> the moment I realized, I pushed the scooter. Then I saw that divers were all around us. They didn't just leave us there alone. That day, we were first, we were face to face with new species of fish that had never been seen anywhere and that has never been named. Let me talk a little bit about cartoon. You know, St. Augustine said, the world is like a book. Those who do not travel have only read a page. My wife and I and our partners in destiny, Dr. Jonathan David and his wife, we went for our own, not their first trip to New Zealand. And we were in Queenstown. And when we got to Queenstown, Pastor Ross Smith, our host in New Zealand, ordered for a helicopter to take us to the top of a mountain, very high. And when we landed on top of the mountain, they showed us down the valley, down, down below, in between the rocks, the mountains. We saw fountains of water coming out of the rocks, and we saw life there feeding and being watered, and we were told no man's foot had ever touched that space. You could only see it from the top of the mountain. We saw it, I felt like going down there, but I couldn't go. They said, is no man's foot had ever trodden upon that place. You think you know God? Are you with me? <laughs> when I landed, when the helicopter landed, I began to look for property. <laughs> Mrs. B is laughing. We were going from realtor to realtor. I wanted a property in Queenstown so that I could always come there for vacation. Mrs. B was just looking at me. At a point, when we got to the third or fourth realtor, she pinched me like this. What next are you coming here? <laughs> I said, huh? <laughs> it was then I woke up from my midsummer day light day dream. Because it was so beautiful, the creature, the things that we saw. Do you know in New Zealand, there are more sheep and lambs than the total population of New Zealand? Yes. 
And yet, God is saying in Psalm 50, I still have the cattle on a thousand hills. The one you have not even accessed at all. Give me some 50. Can I preach a little bit? Psalm 50. The mighty one, God the Lord has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. Give me verse, because of time, verse 7. Psalm 50, verse 7. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. We saw the ones in the valley. He said he still has a cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you why. For the world is mine, and all its fullness. My God. In line with the abundance of God and his nature as a continuous giver, Jesus the Lord spoke to his disciples in Matthew chapter 7, beginning from verse 7. I'll read up to verse 11. Matthew 7, 7 to 11. Ask and it will be given to you. <laughs> Oh, no. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Let me analyze verse 11 of this text of scripture a little bit just to, to, to reorientate your mind and help you get your mind focused on God. In verse 11, Jesus reminded the people that God was their father. And like all fathers, that God loves to bless his children with gifts. Then Jesus pointed out that unlike human fathers, God is not evil. Therefore, his generosity to his children is far greater than that which we see in ourselves and in our parents. Let me tell you what this passage is saying. When he's saying, ask, and you receive, seek, and you will find, knock, and it shall be open. For every man who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door is open. Do you know what God is saying? What Jesus is saying there? All of your human day needs, all of them multiplied to the power of the highest number you have cannot dent my account. I'm not sure you hear me. All of the needs of human beings on the face of the earth multiplied to the power of a thousand, a million cannot dent my account. Everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. To him who knocks, the door is open. The question is, why are you not receiving? Why are you not finding? Why is the door not being opened to you? For the sake of time, I would like to focus, I'm not sure 
do like this. Ah! Do it seriously. I'm not sure you have capacity for what is coming. I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, you know, when I read my sons and daughters and the pastors and, and their write-ups, and I was very impressed. I was very blessed. And I'm not joking. I'm not flattering. I'm saying, oh, my God. I, I, I read one. It gave definition, and it said, God's bountiful blessing. He said, the vision of GBB that he saw in the cruise. I read everything. I read the one that took, hey, the man that fell down, God is able to pick him up. I want Pastor Biela to preach how God picked David up from when he fell with Bathsheba and when he confessed his sin. I read yours. I read yours. I read everyone. And I said, wow. But you know what? New brooms clean well. But the old brooms know where to go. <laughs> so I want to give you the old broom dimension of your presentation so that, my God, wherever you stand, you will speak as one have no authority. So today I'm not going to bother about definition. I'll leave it to small boys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I define God, uh, generosity and define nature. It's wonderful. It's good to carry people along. But I leave that for you. And I leave it to you too to take your own dictionary and go find the meaning of generosity and nature. I'm not touching that. I'm just focusing on things that are important. There are two attributes and characteristics of God that show his generous nature. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay. Do like this. Uh, uh. I'm not hearing you. Uh, uh. Uh, uh, uh. You say, what is that? Lord, enlarge my capacity to receive, to retain, and to be able to release in the days to come. Can I hear? Amen. Amen. Two important ways the Bible describes God. And summarizes his generous nature. One, the Bible describes God as the creator. The creator. And two, the Bible describes God as the redeemer. The first one is creator. The second is the Redeemer. These two descriptions point out clearly that God is the one who gives us both material life and spiritual life. He gives us what? Both the material life and spiritual life. This title reveals the essence of God and throughout the Bible, he is worshipped in both roles. He is worshipped as a creator. He is worshipped as a redeemer. Let me establish that before a large capacity will help you to attain where we are going in this season. Now why we recall that as we parked at the airport in... Toronto, about to board a plane to go back to Atlanta, I stopped both Elder Loketui and his wife. I said, I want to tell you what God said to me about the year 2024. And I want us to pray because I received it this morning. Uncommon and unusual elevation. Uncommon and unusual insight. Uncommon and unusual foresight. Uncommon and unusual stability in the lives of our people. 2024, you'll be so highly elevated because God is the one lifting you up. You'll be shocked at what will happen. You know when these six children of Israel were tending to the flock, to the gold, to the silver of Egyptians, they did not know they were taking care of their own stuff because they bankrupted Egypt. And God granted them favor to take what they have not been paid for for 430 years to take it in one day. We are going to see surprises in 2024 
The preparation for it is now. As we enter September, October, November, December, you are going to go higher than ever before. In the mighty name of Jesus, there are two biblical descriptions of God that show his generous nature. Number one, the creator. Number two, the redeemer. And God is worshipped excitedly, enthusiastically about these two. Let's establish it in the Bible. The book of Revelation. Chapter number four. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy, O Lord. To receive glory, honor, and power. For thou art created and all things Oh my God, they are and were created. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive. chapter 4 verse number 11 you may be seated Revelation 4 11 the elders were the ones singing here and they sang you are worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power why for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created here God is worshipped as a creator of the material life. A few verses later, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, the same elders sang a new song, saying, Revelation 5, 9, and they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy. Not about creation now. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you are slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Here God is worshipped as our redeemer who gives us spiritual life. People of God, the Bible celebrates God's twin gifts of creation and redemption is material given and spiritual given. Here is where you need capacity. Are you ready? This is where you need spiritual capacity to understand how to relate with God and not be a religious hypocrite. Are you ready? Are you sure? You receive this from me? I can't hear you. Yes, sir. I want to share a serious point I want you to ponder upon. It may shock you that the Bible does not suggest that his spiritual gifts are more important than his material gifts or vice versa. You do. I think we should stop here and come back another day. By that time, all the nuances of this message would have been given by all our pastors. This is your assignment this month. If you take the microphone, all you are saying in preparation for unusual and uncommon elevation where God is taking us, all you are saying is God's generous nature. I like to repeat that point. And then establish it in the word of God. That he may shock you that the Bible does not suggest that his spiritual gifts are more important than his material gifts or his material gifts more important than spiritual gifts. 
my understanding of scripture by the grace of God and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that both spiritual and material gifts of God are appreciated with equal enthusiasm. I know that many of you will quickly like him. Uh, what's his name? Huh? Shobande and the rest of you in, uh, who had gone to Bar Pastor Ike's Bible College, you all be ready and said, Pastor, what are you saying? Especially if you have been reading every Monday a piece of, uh, of Dr. Patrick, and you have been jumping from prayer meeting to prayer meeting and say, Pastor, what you are saying is not scriptural. Because you have read in the Bible that wisdom is better than gold. Hmm? I know you quickly jump to the book of Job. You quickly jump to the book of Proverbs and begin to, I know you. So I pre, listen. I prepare for you before your questions start coming. I'm a trained lawyer. A trained lawyer prepares three cases for one case. He prepares his own case that he would like to impress the judge with. He will step into the mind of the judge to see how he will think and receive what he has prepared. And then he will turn to his opponent to dismantle his own case. So when I stand here to preach, I imagine Satan is coming to steal what you're about to hear. I knock him off. And then I take cobwebs out of your mind and plant the engrafted word. So let's go into scripture, beginning from Job, to compare the spiritual with the material. For this instance, we will use wisdom as spiritual gift and gold, silver, and rubies as material. And you see in plain terms that the scripture says, the value of wisdom cannot be compared with that gold or silver. Yes? Why are you doing like this? Yes or no? Okay, let's read. Let's read. Even if this is where we stop, we'll come back another day. There's so much more. The book of Job, chapter 28. Verse 12 to 19. I'll just take that. Job 28, 12 to 19. I've seen Pastor Femi with Job saying, uh -huh. Yes, Pastor. I will buy Looney. <laughs> but where can wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its value. Nor is it found in the land of the living. The deep says it is not in me. And the sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be purchased for gold, nor can silver be weighed for its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of offer, in precious onyx or sapphire. Neither gold nor crystal can equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewelry or fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or quartz for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. So if we stand here, what do you believe? Wisdom is of greater value than gold or silver or rubies or topaz. Yes or no? Good. Let's read further. Proverbs. Chapter 3, 13 to 18. Get ready. Proverbs 3, 13 to 18. Our peace is a man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For our proceeds are better than the profits of silver and are gained than fine gold. Do you speak English? She's more precious than rubies and all the things you may desire cannot compare with Ha! Huh. Length of days is in her right hand. In her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her parts are peace. Come on, verse 18. She is a tree of life, 
to those who take hold of her and happy are all who retain her. Can you compare the spiritual with material with all that we have read? Let's go to chapter 8 of Proverbs. Proverbs 8, 11 to 21. We are not sweeping anything on the carpet. Proverbs 8, 11 to 21. You read this together so that nobody is confusing you later. Ready? Read. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things one may desire cannot be compared with her. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance, and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, all the judges of the earth. I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than, hey, 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 stop. My fruit is better than, did you go to school? Can anybody misinterpret this? My fruit is better than gold, Yes, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I traverse the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of justice, that I may cause those who love me to inherit wealth, that I may fill their treasuries. The question now is, dear pastor, how can anyone Read this text of scripture that you've just read and not conclude that the spiritual life given to us by God is by far superior to the material life given to us by the same God. If you read this passage that I've just read and many others, won't you conclude that easily? The spiritual life given to us is better than material life. Won't you conclude? Yes, you conclude if you have gone to University of Ife. But if you have gone to Unilag, <laughs> off school, <laughs> neither will give you what you're hearing. If professors are wise, they will not be broke. Please lend me your ears and listen to the following three points before you thrash my submission that we should appreciate both the material and the spiritual with equal enthusiasm. Point number one, it is God, the same God who gave both the material life and the spiritual life. Therefore, nothing given by God is inferior. Are you with me? Are you with me? Uh, uh, you are not. I know you when you are with me. You are still weighing it. Teacher, don't teach me nonsense. God Almighty who gave the spiritual life is the same God Almighty who gave the material life and there's nothing inferior about him or from him. Point number two. If that does not settle well with you, and you still have other questions regarding this matter, please know that sometimes, before you can access the spiritual, you may have to use the material. <laughs> it is therefore not an accident that Proverbs 3, 9, and 10 are placed before the virtues of wisdom in Proverbs 3, 13 to 14. Are you listening? Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Let's read. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. 
after God had set that in order, he now takes you to 13 and 14 of the same book of Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs 3, 13 and 14. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding for our process are better than the profits of silver and are gained than fine gold. So if you do have not learned how to honor God with your substance and with the first fruits of your increase, happy, finding <laughs> wisdom is, is a tall order. Oh, you say, well, pastor, um, uh, you're a lawyer. Don't trick us. No, this is not tricking you. I just want you to know that Cornelius needed salvation and redemption. And the access point to it was arms that he was given. God said, your prayers and arms have come before me as a memorial. Therefore, send for Peter to show you how to get saved. If you say one is inferior, the other is superior, I want to show you that, can I give you, okay. <laughs> I leave Mrs. Kuyoro alone because last Sunday she wore the outfit for her daughter's wedding and I was looking at her Nobody gave me any material for that wedding. God knows your address. It's okay. <laughs> now, please, do not take this message out of context and begin to think that salvation or the gifts of God are for sale. They are not for sale. They cannot be sold to the highest bidder. If you think they are for sale, just recall what happened, hey, 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 what happened to Gehazi. Naaman was cured of his leprosy and he came before Elisha to give him gifts and he refused. Why? Healing is not for sale. Gehazi felt, wait a minute, this man had so changed us again. Pursued Naaman and said, Some prophets, sons of prophets, had just come. My master said, I must pursue you to take some. And he gave him. He said, All right. Did not my eye go with you? When you turn aside to take those things, is this the time for real estate? Is this the time for olive groves? You know, no, 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 no. You don't understand delay gratification. Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman will cling to you and your sons forever and ever. End of story. But if you think Elisha would refuse everything, go to chapter number 8 and see that the king of Syria sent 40 camels of all good things of Syria. The king of Naaman sent 40 camel loads to him. When you learn not to sell spiritual things that God gives you freely, freely you have received, freely give, he will sustain you, he will raise much more than you can ever think or imagine. And see, that's Old Testament, let's come into the new. If you think that spiritual gifts go to the highest bidder, then remember Simon the sorcerer. You understand me? When, when Peter began to lay hands on people and they were receiving the gifts of the Holy Spirit, he offered him money. He said, get this money and give me the spiritual gift so that whosoever I lay hands on will receive baptism in the Holy Ghost. Ah, Peter said, your money perishes with you. You think the gift of God can be purchased. Now here is the point. That many or some people did not understand last Sunday. When my son, family, family, they began to pray before he stepped into teaching. I say, every serpent, everyone that's hindering the businesses and the blessings of God in this house, let God uproot them completely and banish them and destroy them. One person went online and said, Hey, Pastor, our pastor does not call so. He does not know I was online. So I jumped on him. I said, come at, read Matthew 7. Woe to you, Kurasin. 
Woe to you, Bethsaida. Woe to you. And then I took him to Matthew 23. Woe to you, stripes and Pharisees. This is Jesus cursing. The man is not, except you are one of them, he's not cursing anybody. He's cursing those who are against the vision of God that they be uprooted and be destroyed completely. I said amen to the prayers. So when I corrected him, he's so wise. He said, I understand now, sir. I understand now, sir. And then I said, okay, that's it. I watch you. <laughs> that was a, a very timely prayer. Can I say why to you? Huh? You want to know? Okay. Mrs. B, would you tell the rest of the story? You finish your prayer here. I was in my study in America. I was preparing for Friday Bible study that I did here. That was what I was doing. And I lifted my eye. It had never happened in that house before. Right at the door was a serpent doing his tongue like this at me. I calmly pulled myself together with the shoes I wore. I jumped on his head and smashed it. I smashed it a second time. And I took a boat to cut it into two. Then I went to call others calmly. I said, come, I need a pan. Uh, I just killed a serpent. He said, serpent, where? We have where, where, where? They took it. They burnt it. They took the photograph of the serpent and sent it to Fisayo. Mrs. B did that. And Fisayo said, thank God. We were praying last night. The fivefold was praying. And one of them said there was danger around daddy. And they prayed. And they just left it there. You don't know when people are praying. You mean it does not matter how can a serpent get to that place? We had never seen it. There was no wood. There was no forest around. And we called exterminators to please look at the holes. There was no hole found anywhere. They just did what they had to do. But I know. You, 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 you understand this? Yes, sir. You, you want me to sing? Eshwole kole ti Jesu Eshwole kole ti Jesu Mo kole awo Eshwole kole ti Jesu Mo kole awo Eshwole kole ti Jesu 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 Mo kole awo Eshwole kole ti Jesu Leave those ones alone. Those are small, small politicians. Leave them alone. I want to Niwala Baba. Niwala Raba. I want to Niwala Raba. Niwala Raba. Oh, say Lun Niwala Raba. Why is it important to pray such prayers when the Holy Spirit leads us? Because there are parasites, there are serpents, green snakes under green grass, acting like saints, pretending to be saints, but are bound by iniquity. I want you to remember 
that Simon the sorcerer joined the church, was baptized before he started offering for money for spiritual gifts. There are those who are using juju to negotiate. You cannot get to me. Yeah. Yeah. All your offsprings are ruined and finished forever. In the mighty name of Jesus. Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall by enemies hurt you. Mrs. B, what was that song that I sang as I was coming out of sleep before we started? You forgot it. <sighs> when I remember, I was singing it. I was singing it out of my sleep. And then, so the scripture began. When I remember, I'll sing it. God knew. You understand me? The hour and the season we are in. No weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. In the mighty name of Jesus. Any Simon the sorcerer, yea, who are bound by iniquity, God will expose them. God will uproot them. God will destroy them completely. In this house, the fire of God will fall upon them and consume them in Jesus' mighty name. Ija dokpi ogu sita olubala song I was singing out of my sleep I did not know it has never happened to us I, I, I saw his tongue like this. I just went calm if I scream it will run I will not know where to look for it if I don't act, he will act. <laughs> Let me tell you this. Every tongue that has risen against you, they are condemned in judgment. Blindness, paralysis, stroke, that is their portion. In Jesus' mighty name. Sit down. Can I go home? All right. I gave you point number one. That's all. The same God Almighty who gave the spiritual also gave the material. And there's nothing about him that comes from him that is inferior. Number two, sometimes you will have to use material things to access the spiritual. Is that clear to you? Yes. Now, wisdom that we read about that is spiritual. Let me show you if you don't have material, how it becomes redundant and almost uh, a waste of time. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, beginning from verse 11. Ecclesiastes 9, 11 to 16. I return and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, 
but time and chance happen to them all. Like fish taken in a, for a man does, also does not know his time. Like, a, like fish taken in a crane net, like birds caught in a snare. So the sons of men are snared in an evil time when he falls suddenly upon them. Pay attention. This wisdom I've also seen under the sun, and it seemed great to me. This wisdom. What wisdom? There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it, besieged it, and built great snares around it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that same poor man. Then I said, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. Which one is spiritual? Which one is natural? So if you have the spiritual without natural, you are like a bird with one wing. You can't fly. If you have the natural without the spiritual, you are also like a man clapping with one hand. You need both that God has given, the spiritual life and material life, to be relevant and to become a force to reckon with on the face of the earth. So both spiritual and material gifts must be celebrated with great enthusiasm. Have I made sense to you? Are these constantly celebrated with the same enthusiasm in the Bible? Let's look for other verses of scripture out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, a truth will be established. Psalm 19, verse 1 to 14. The heavens declare the glory of God. This is creation. We sang it, all heavens declare. Okay. And the farmer man shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, no language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run his race. Verse number six, his rising is from one end of heaven, and his circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from his heat. Now, here he is celebrating creation. Sun, everything God created in the universe. He was singing praises about them. From verse 1 to 6, it was all about creation. But from verse 7, he began to speak about the spiritual. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous together. More to be desired a day than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Go on, moreover, by them your servant is one, and in keeping them there is great reward. See where he's going. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret falls. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. What did he start with? The creator. What did he end up with? The redeemer. Both must be celebrated with great enthusiasm. The spiritual gift and the material gift. Let's take one scripture in the New Testament. We have read Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, but let's take one more. Colossians 1, from verse 12 to 20. Colossians 1, 12 to 20. Let me read verse 14, 16, and 19, and 20, so that you can see both the twin gifts of creation and redemption. In verse 14, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Why? He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Verse 20. For it pleased the Father that in him the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So you see the created order. And you see how he redeemed us through his blood. Both must be celebrated. One is not inferior to the other. Let me ask you this question. Which is more important? Are you ready, ID? Which is more important? The cross of Jesus or his manifestation when the world became flesh? Mike, huh? if the world did not become flesh, who would go to the cross? Now, this is where you have trouble. You think creation ended in the Garden of Eden. No. He's still creating. And he will still create. I think I'm stopping here. I don't want you confused at all. But I want you to know when you hear the generous nature of God, there are two parameters we can use to begin to measure and gauge how awesome God is. Creation is the creator. Redemption is redeemer. If you look at every word used in terms of redemption, uh, uh, salvation, uh, justification, they are all gifts given to us. We did nothing to end them. I, I'll come back and finish this message. Time is gone. I want you to know that you will receive many from my colleagues, but I want you to know, stay focused on God as a creator and God as a redeemer. You will understand the generous nature that you don't deserve salvation, but he gave it all the same. Let me close with this. The risk of giving. Who you give your phone to can damage it. Yes, sir. That's the risk. God took that risk. In Genesis 1, after he had created everything and brought man into being, and he said to the man, I give unto you. The first word he spoke is I give. But he took a risk. Because man damaged the gift. That's why he brought redemption. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. That man, anyone you give anything could damage it. I wish Gidigba is here. Uh, Shegun. When Shegun was in school, hmm? this Shegun turn away. Now, he doesn't lose his phone because he's using his money to buy it. <laughs> Every time I return home, Shagun has lost his phone. I will go and buy a second one. I bought a third one. I bought a fourth one. Oh, yeah, money to But this day, he doesn't lose his phone at all. There is a risk involved in giving. That when you give a gift, it could be damaged. But God Almighty. <laughs> the lamb was slain from before the foundation of the earth to ensure that man will be redeemed. Listen to me. We will break this into its nitty gritty. You will understand what God did for you. And you will understand his generous nature. That kogbo wo kogbo bi.
Genesis 129 is your take home scripture. Genesis 129. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that you seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit ye seed to you shall be for food. See, I have given you. You know, what you do with that seed determines whether you exercise dominion or not on the face of the earth. See, I have given you.